Welcome to the abundant life in the now evangelistic meetings. Those who are here in the auditorium and those out in the world, may the good Lord guide us as we seek to understand his word. I would like to appreciate my young friends whom I will give an opportunity at the end to give us another piece of music, beautiful singing. Appreciate the sound from the, the pianist, um, beautiful sound. And then, of course, the team from the communications department, the camera, uh, men and women, and those who are moving around us to make sure that things happen here, without whom little can be done here. I thank you for your commitment, and I pray that God Almighty will continue to bless you. Tonight, I would like to speak on the subject, bad people with good names. Bad people with good names. In the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Please turn with me to that book, Acts, chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, where the Bible says in the... New King James Version. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these things. The context of this particular story is that time when the spirit has descended in his fullness among God's people, the early believers. You will remember how Jesus, before he left for heaven, had directed his disciples, not just the apostles, but his disciples who had been, and they had been gathering um, 
about 120 of them. He had directed them, please don't leave until the Holy Spirit has descended upon you. And so at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended. And when he came, there was such an amazing, amazing fullness of the display of God's graces among God's people. They had never seen anything like it. People were on fire for God when it came to hearing the word of God. They would always meet around 3 p.m. at the temple to meet to listen as the disciples preach the word of God. At that time, the believers were on fire as far as prayer was concerned. They would meet time and again and just pray and God was just all over the show. At that time, there was great fellowship. At that time also, the church, some of the people who had means managed to sell and proceeds were given to people who had nothing. This is the context of this particular story. Ananias. The meaning of this particular name. Gift of the Lord. All God has given. What a beautiful name this is. You see, among God's people at that time and even now, names were not just dispensed anyhow. Whatever it is you wanted projected is what you gave. This particular child who God has given us, what do we want them to be? What sort of character of God do we want them to spread? So names were very, very important. Ananias means gift of the Lord, all God has given. A beautiful name. What about Sapphira? Sapphira means beautiful or precious. Now one would... Uh, think that people wearing such beautiful names cannot find themselves in scripture in such bad light. You know, wearing a false name is the biggest challenge in Christianity generally and Adventism in particular. You see, as uh, God's people, we wear the name Christian, a beautiful name, after the one who established this religion. But the paradox of it all, the iron of it all, is that although we wear this beautiful name when it comes to what we do, generally speaking, it's the exact opposite. One would have thought that Christians would be on fire for God just as Christ himself, the founder of Christianity, was on fire for God. But the opposite, generally speaking, is the truth. Shame. When Jesus speaks of the church there in Laodicea, and you know the history of the Christian church is divided into seven segments beginning with the church at Ephesus all the way to the church of Laodicea which would be God's last day church. It's very interesting how God looks, how Jesus looks at that particular church. If you read in Revelation chapter 3 from 14, it says uh, Laodicea, you are to be pitied because you are poor, you are wretched, you are blind, and you are naked.
the one who would have thought that a church that was established by Jesus Christ would be on fire that it would not receive such scathing rebuke from the Lord himself. But this is the irony of each all that we who wear this beautiful name we call Christian in terms of what we do it's the exact opposite. So wearing a false name is the biggest challenge in Christianity generally and Adventism in particular. Now a need according to this story was we need in the community prompted these two people, this couple, to sell their land in order to help. There was a problem in the community. And just as quite a number of believers were doing, selling their property and bringing the proceeds to the apostles, so Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, also got encouraged and sold a piece of land. Now notice, when we read the story, before selling their property, they agreed as a couple to bring all the money at the apostles' feet to use it in the work of the Lord. So, the property was sold and they had money. When they had money, the good looks of money became a temptation to the couple. Needs that were not there suddenly were there. And I think this is what we all see. You know, when you don't have money, there are so many things that are not necessary. Once God helps you to have means, then things begin to sprout needs that were no longer that had not been there before begin to sprout suddenly from nowhere and this is exactly what we see i i i like the words of ellen g white who makes this observation in in the book christian service uh, on page 148 she says it is not the empty cup that we have trouble in carrying. It is a cup full to the brim that must be carefully uh, balanced. She goes on. Affliction and adversity may cause much inconvenience and may bring great depression. But it is prosperity that is dangerous to spiritual life. We need to be thanking God. Many times when we pray, even when we are sincere, God, if you help me to have this, I am going to do this and that. God who sees all things as they are. God who knows us from inside and outside. He knows that if he were to bless us with means, Many of us, that would be the end of our relationship with Christ. You have seen how it is even among God's people when you have money and you have means and you have property and your life has suddenly changed. You are no longer as faithful. You are no longer as passionate to the things of God as you used to be before God blessed you with means. So we need to thank God. In our poverty, God has helped us to have a relationship that is strong. And so we need to be careful every time we pray that God will bless us with means. And oftentimes when we pray for those blessings at the back of our mind, we are even deceiving ourselves into thinking when God blesses me with means, I will do the following things. In the line of God's work. God knows what we don't know. Means are going to sprout up and suddenly a man who had one wife now wants to have ten. Suddenly 
a man who had uh, who was a, a, a good person in the neighborhood now uh, becomes a bad person in the neighborhood God knows he does not make mistakes so affliction and adversity may cause much inconvenience and may bring great depression but it is prosperity that is dangerous to spiritual life there are lessons in this lesson number one is that temptations reveal the weakness or strength of the character they provide an opportunity for self discovery temptation reveals the weakness or strength of the character before this particular trial came to Ananias and Sapphira they thought they were strong people that's what they thought but God allowed this particular trial to come upon them in order to expose something that was deep in their character something perhaps they didn't know so temptation is very useful because God uses it to help us discover who we are. If you've read Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 24, he says the one who hears these words of mine, the wise man is the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Now, when the winds came and and what? And the rains came and blew and beat against that particular structure. It was able to stand the temptation, the trial that came is what revealed what sort of structure this was whether it was a deep in its foundation or not so when temptations come our way we need to thank god because through them we discover who we are self-discovery but now uh, i notice temptations don't need to end in sin because god weighs what he allows and provides a way out it's not necessary you see god uses temptation to expose certain uh, 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 weak points in our character but we do not need to bow to temptation because we have read this and i'm just hoping that by the end of this series someone will have committed this particular bible text to memory first corinthians 10 13 first corinthians 10 13 the bible says no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind and god is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear but when you are tempted he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it so when temptation come and remember god allows it uh, 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 sometimes oftentimes in order to expose something you didn't know about yourself and once it is revealed it is not necessary that you should bow to that temptation because when god allowed that particular trial to come the god who had already gone ahead of you already prepared a way out for you number two they withheld a portion of the lord's money intending to use it for personal needs what is the big lesson there well simply this to use god's money because what is left is too little for our needs can be dangerous you use god's money okay you use god's money now in this particular story ananias and sapphira had said all the amount whatever they would receive 
out of selling that particular property. All of that would go to God. So that was God's money. Now, when you decide to take what does not belong to you, what belongs to God, that's a problem. And this is not the only distortion. This is not the only problem. There are other things that we can talk about, other money distortion behaviors. And very quickly, let me talk about them. One of them is, now, please don't forget that here we are talking about, you know, why, why it, 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 is, it is important that uh, what belongs to God is uh, not used for personal uh, 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 needs because that money belongs to God. But now, this is not the only distortion. There are other money distortion ideas that we need to talk about in the context of this particular passage. You see, living beyond our means oftentimes tempts us to go into debt. That, that is a distortion to live beyond your means. God does not make mistakes. He doesn't. So whatever it is he has given you at a particular time, that is what is necessary for you to earn your living, to live your life. That is what is necessary. But when you begin to think that, no, what is there is not sufficient for my needs, and then you begin to borrow, you're making a big mistake. Because in borrowing, you are failing to go back to the promises of God. In Matthew chapter 6, 25, do not be anxious. That is what the word of the Lord says. Live within your means. Many church members as I speak today, whether it be in this audience or out there, are living beyond their means. And many of them are stuck in debt. Perhaps they will never ever be able to pay this side of eternity. I used to, to have somebody... I knew very well um, who fell into debt. Uh, where I come from, they call this particular debt Kalova. You go, for example, if uh, Pastor Akali here uh, or Pastor Alo um, is a money lender, you go there and if you get, for example, 1,000 Kenyan shillings. Uh, at the end of the month, you need to bring 1,600. The interest is just so high. If you don't bring 1,600, that particular month you are supposed to bring it and you push it to the following month, it doubles and it goes on and on and on like that. I had somebody I knew who fell into this kind of a trap. I decided to bail him out said, you know, maybe if I assist him, he will begin on a new slate. He was very happy when all his debts were cleared. But in his mind now, he thought, now I am so happy because I have a clean slate. I can now begin afresh getting more money. He sank once again into heavy debts. Again, the spirit guided me. Help this man. And I cleared all his debts. He was happy again. I have been assisted. I now have a clean a slate. He started. At that point I said, I am not God. I do not have the capacity to create human beings. Now I will not help this man. Because for him when he is helped, he now thinks, this gives him the reason now to fall back into this trap. There are many uh, 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 people, children of God, who find themselves trapped in heavy debt. They don't even know how they will ever get out of this. 
So many uh, distortion, many behavior, distortion, living beyond our means, love of fashion, and technological gadgets and materialistic lifestyle. That is another distortion. When you are a child of God, to be a child of God that does not mean you should be showing off. There are people today who drive vehicles they are not supposed to be driving. The only reason they drive them is that they feel they need to show off that they are somebody. You see, you are in this particular profession. Maybe you are a medical doctor, you are a lawyer, you are an engineer. And the people in that profession drive this type of a vehicle. And so, even for you, in order to show that you belong to this particular profession, you buy this particular vehicle. When you become a child of God, there is no showing off. It's the spirit of Christ. Philippians 2.5 Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who even though he was God did not count equality with God something to be grasped. You see if I were Christ came to this earth one of the things I would have really wanted to do was to parade it all before people to wow them. Look when you talk about Lord, God Almighty, this is it. And yet when we read about Jesus Christ, he was the humble man of Galilee. So when you become a child of God, you are controlled by the principles of God. It is not a thing of showing off. I also drive a Mac. Drive a BMW. No. You bought it basically because you wanted to show off love of gadgets, our young people, leading them at many times to prostitution. I want an iPhone 15. You are just in high school. An iPhone 15 is an expensive phone. You are not working. And you know, in order for you to get that particular gadget because you love these things, you will enter into prostitution. It's a distortion, a materialistic lifestyle. When you look at, uh, you know, some of the things we have, uh, you go to some of these ladies and you count the shoes they have. You can literally be wearing a pair for 30 days, different shoes for 30 days. There are shoes they have never worn for years, but they are still there. You look at uh, some of uh, the uh, things that are there, the cutlery and all of these things uh, that people have, 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 have bought and uh, with the, help, the hope that, you know, perhaps one day when the pastor visits, we will display them. No! Materialistic lifestyle. Look at the suits. Some of these guys, when you walk into their wardrobes and you look at the shirts and you look at all these things that they have, in years they have never worn them, but they keep on buying because to them, every little thing that appears, because it is fashionable, they must also grab it. No, when you become a child of God, that is not how life is supposed to be lived. It is simplicity when you are a child of God. Peer pressure. We want to live like the Joneses. You see, um, this is very, very similar to what we talked about where there is pressure. This type of a thing you do you cannot be looking like, you know, these other people. There is pressure. I love Jesus because when I look at Christ to Jesus, even though he was God Almighty, he lived a simple life. We, 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 we've complicated ourselves. We've become so complicated. And this is the reason why 
uh, often times we even fail to reach other people because when they look at us, we are so far away from the reality on the ground. Another distortion to live only for today and not save for tomorrow. Now, there has to be a balance here that it is important that you are not just looking to the future, but you must also spend some of your money today and just chill and have a wonderful time. But you must also be mindful of the fact that there is a future. Saving is important. Lesson number three in this. Two heads are better than one. Marriage is one God-given method of offering checks and balances to each other. Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, they live as a couple. You see, um, our pastor, Akali, the senior minister here, would be in a weak position if he were to be alone. When he married his wife, there are many things he will bounce on his wife, bounce off, and you know, his wife will say, No, honey, if we do this, maybe this will be a problem. It's important when people live in a marriage relationship, some men are so hot, I don't even know how to describe them in, 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 in English. They think that simply because they are the head, they cannot listen to the wife. There is a proverb in my language which says, I'll put it in English. You see, words spoken by a woman um, are very important. You better listen because uh, often, very often than not, they are true. Now, when women speak, they may not add it up using uh, 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 computations uh, that are mathematical. But God has given women intuition which he never gave men. Women can understand a particular a thing from intuition. They will say, no, no, no. If we move this particular direction, it could lead to this. And if you ask, can you explain to me why you think that way? They may not be able to give you a mathematical uh, idea about it. But God gave them wisdom. Listen, so when people live together, husband and wife, it's a way to balance life. It's a way of offering checks and balances to each other. And I'm very surprised that in this particular situation, both were dunderheads. No one was willing to offer advice to the other. No one was willing to, to offer advice. If you ask women, women will say, well, you know, men don't listen. Women will actually say, the woman in the story, Sapphira, actually, must have told her husband, honey, I don't think this is the way to go. But because men are <laughs> difficult, they don't listen. So the guy said, no, 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 it's okay, let's go this way. Uh, you know, let, let me address men on this particular subject because oftentimes we don't want to listen. The reason why God provided that woman to us is to help us. If God understood that life would be simple and straightforward and we would not need any help, he would not have created women. But he understood that women would be important to the process. He created them. Listen to what women are saying. Two heads are better than one. Number four, leave God out of the picture. If you leave God out of this particular picture, Ananias and Sapphira are good and generous people. Put God in the picture. They are thieves. The money that they brought, you know, before, the, um, before Peter, had the Holy Spirit not intervened, 
you know, Peter and all the rest of the people would have gone celebrating them that these people indeed are generous. But when God walks into the picture, God who knows our potential, there are people even in this our audience here who when they bring their tithes, they bring their offerings, we, we, we get carried away. God who knows their potential knows that they are thieves. They are not bringing the entire amount as it should be. He knows. So please, in this particular passage, let me say something to all of us. We may deceive fellow human beings in bringing a tithe that is not really the way it should be computed. We can bring an offering that is not the way it should be computed. But let me put it to us that up in heaven where it really matters. They know that we are like Ananias and Sapphira. They were thieves. Number five. What Ananias and his wife bring to the church, regardless of how big it is, appears to own Lucas, falls short of what it should be in the eyes of God. It's the same thing. Now notice, we all thought Ananias and his wife were the owners of the property they sold, but suddenly the owner appears and gives a statement. I thought this was my thing. I thought this message is, is mine. I thought this is my house. I thought this is my property. When the owner comes into the picture here, he gives a statement. You, Ananias, and you, Sapphira, you are simply stewards. My dear people, one of the reasons why the church of God was on fire for God on this particular point is that they understood that they were simply stewards. There are people in this church. You know, we have big plans one day, you know, to transform this building where we are to make sure that we are not dwarfed by all these people that surround us. We're thinking of one day having, you know, a, a car park just underground and building a temple to God's honor and glory in this place. There are people here with that capacity to help create this kind of a thing here at New Life. You do have them. You do have them. But now the sad reality is that they think it is my property. It is not your property. The money that you have is not your money. The house in which you live is not your house. The wife whom you married is not your own. The land that you acquired is not your land. Ah, oh, do you want me to indicate to you why I believe it is not yours? Well, you need to know that when you came into this life, you came empty-handed. And when you exit, you go the way of all the living, you go empty-handed. You will not carry anything to the grave. You don't own anything here on earth. But you see, we deceive ourselves into thinking it is ours. Let me repeat, my dear friends, when we do have life, now, when we have the capacity, now, when we have the strength, now, when we have it given to us by God as stewards of all times, that is a time to display that it truly belongs to God. It is not ours. There is uh, a teaching in the Bible. You need to honor the vow you make to the Lord. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 to 6. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 to 6. The Bible says. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 to 6. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. 
Do not let your mouth lead you into sin and do not protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. I want you to think. Sometimes we make vows we never fulfill. Here it is. The Bible is telling us when you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. Let me end this way. A simple money issue ends tragically. It ends tragically. If money is not handled according to the Lord's prescription, eternal death will be the result. It might appear now like, okay, there is really nothing to eat. We can spend God's money, misuse it, and do with it whatever we want. In this particular story, God is teaching us something important. Money must be handled according to the Lord's prescription. In Malachi 3, and I end on this. Malachi 3, verses 8 to 10, the Bible says. Malachi 3, verses 8 to 10. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings? You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Those who are here and those who are watching, I appeal to all of you by God's mercies to do what is right. Let us pray. Our Father who lives in heaven, in this tragic story, we learn many truths. One of them being that we don't own anything in this life. We are simply managers. So help us to discharge our duties as managers faithfully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our young people, please come forward and uh, share your music. Bless us.